Wow, we have a show today. Can you possibly imagine what Trekkies and the nature of existence and the truth about marriage and six days in Roswell have in common? Well, today I'm going to be talking about the filmmaker and author, and he is here. He's going to be talking with us, and we are going to go in depth on his new book, The Truth About Marriage. Stay tuned. Welcome to Save Your Sanity Podcast. I'm Dr. Roberta Shaler. Are you living with the chaos, confusion, and uncertainty that a toxic person loves to create? Is a partner, parent, ex, sibling, child, or coworker causing you to second guess yourself? That can be crazy making. I'm here to help you save your sanity. So let's get down to it and figure some things out now. Stay tuned. Well, I'm so glad you're here. If you're coming back because you've heard the show before, I'm delighted that you found value and returned. And if you've just found us, great. I'm so glad to have you here, and I hope you'll be a returning visitor too. Today, I'm so excited. I have a filmmaker that you probably don't know his name as much as you know the names of his films, but also a producer who's done shows on television that you definitely know. So I'm so happy to welcome Roger Nygaard to the show. Hi. Hello. It's, hey, it's fun to be here. Thank you. Oh, it's such fun to be here. And it was such fun to prepare because who knew? Who knew the depths of all these things that you've done? And they're real renaissance, man. I'm sure you've heard that before. When you're going from Roswell to marriage to Trekkies, I, and then my most delightful feature that I found out about you, the nature of existence, <laughs> then we're going to have such fun talking about this. So tell us a little bit about why these very diverse subjects and topics fascinate you. You know, it kind of drives my agent crazy. Like, what do you do? Who are you? I'm a writer, director, editor, producer. You kind of have to do everything when you're making documentaries. What happens for me is I get obsessed with a topic. Usually it's something that's bothering me personally. And then I set out to solve the mystery and by doing so bring along my cameras and record it and the viewer then can come along and you can, you'll learn as I learn. For example, when I uh, profiled this subculture of humanity called Star Trek fans or Trekkies, that was my first documentary. I, w I thought these people are really interesting and, 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 <laughs> and funny and it turned out they were, which led to a sequel. I did two of those. Then I got interested in aliens and profiled the town of Roswell, New Mexico, and are aliens coming here or not, and another mystery to solve, which then led me to existentialism, which had been bothering me actually since I was about seven years old when I look backwards in my life, which was the first time that I experienced the thought of my own mortality. And then later at the age of 13, when my father died, it brought mortality very clear, crystallized for me that this is a very temporary thing that we have here, which, you know, when you're a kid, you just, you know, I've been here forever. I'm sure I'll be here forever. Why wouldn't I be? And you don't even think about it. But when it's forced upon you, when you're forced to consider your own purpose and what, how do I find happiness in life? And is it transitory? And all these questions, it's very upsetting <laughs> to the, to, to it was to me, to the human psyche. And I'm no, no uh, uh, different. So I set out to solve that point, that purpose in my film, the, the Nature of Existence. Why are we here? And what are we supposed to do about it? And does it really matter? And ultimately that came down to a question of, I, I, I realized people were asking, well, okay, all this is very hard to understand. Can you just tell me how to be happy? <laughs> how do I find happiness? And then that links into relationships and marriage. And the, the most recent mystery that I set out to solve is why are relationships so hard for people? So that's a quick tour of what has obsessed me in my, my documentary projects. Well, I think you said the magic word obsessed because I think, you know, we're very similar in that way. Like when I have an idea, when I have a subject matter that intrigues me, I have to buy all the books, go deeply into it, learn everything there is, end up teaching it, meriting a book about it. And then, okay, what's next? Like, what am I going to turn my attention to now? Because 
okay, I've got that. Let me take it along and, and go to the next thing because everything that I learned in delving into this applies to delving into something else. So what do you think the lure of the unknowable is for you? I've been curious about everything since I was a child. I think curiosity is a natural property of human nature and particularly children. It's necessary to be curious because you're growing and learning and how are you going to, you need to survive. You have to be curious about your surroundings. So it's a natural extension and expression of that into my work, into my field to investigate whatever I'm curious about. Unfortunately, I think a lot of adults they their natural curiosity gets suppressed because you got to pay the bills you got to get a job and maybe it's a job you don't like and you do the same thing over and over and you just want to come home and, and relax and watch tv and fall asleep and all these things divert you from the pursuit of of life which is understanding and enjoying and and, and experiencing life to its fullest which ultimately that's where happiness lies right i mean one thing i learned in making the truth about marriage is that we're all responsible for our own happiness. People often look, I've got to find a partner who will make me happy. But that's a false goal because if you give someone the power to make you happy, they also have the power to make you unhappy. So someone's control, now someone has control of your happiness and it's not the right place. You need to look inward and it has to do with why are you here? What are you doing? What is your, what is your point? And if your point is to do the same job over and over and come home and zone out and do it again, your natural instinct for curiosity gets reduced and suppressed. And I like to awaken that. And I, obviously you have that and you're, I, I get a, a stack of books, you know, this high and when I'm starting a, on, a, on a new quest, read everything. And then I contact the authors and see who will talk to me. And then I go and I, I seek them out with my camera and I interrogate them for two hours. I put them through <laughs> like you're going to do to me, you're, I'm sure. <laughs> and, and learn what I can from them. I love it. Of course, I love it because we do process in similar ways, but you brought up something, Roger, I just want to follow up on. And that's this notion. Well, two notions I want to follow up. One is the notion that somehow happiness comes with some kind of certainty. If you can find the key to happiness, you will always have it. And that seems like a dichotomous approach to things because neither of those things are true. If you find happiness is maybe fleeting. And if, if you find certainty, you may not find happiness for many minutes. <laughs> and those two things are, are really connected in a very, very immediate and kind of vaporous way. I mean, they may intersect for a moment, but they're not necessarily true, correct? Yeah, you can't have happiness without unhappiness. You must have both and you must cycle between both poles. Otherwise, if you only had one thing all the time, it would, it would lose value over time. You have to have the opposite with it. Mm -hmm. I think the opposites are there, but we ha also have this second notion I want to talk to you about because I had a guest recently and it didn't come up in the interview, but we were chatting before the show and, and then she followed up. She wanted to talk to me later and here was her question. She said, I've invested all of this time in becoming at the top of my field, you know, and I am at the top of my field and I'm not happy. And so she wanted to talk to me. She said, just like she would want to know from you, how did you get so courageous to go all the way to the top of this and then go off and go to the top of something else? <laughs> what was it within uh, yourself? She asked me, so I'm asking you, what makes it so that you can go from one mountain peak to the other and create the tightrope when you walk it? It's the challenge. The happiness is in the challenge. If that's the idea of heaven, for example, to me is problematic because if you go to a place where everything's perfect and wonderful and you're happy all the time, after a while, if you're on this permanent heroin drip, you're going to, you're going to get uh, unhappy. You're going to become unhappy without a new challenge. We need to be challenged. And part of having happiness is having a partner who challenges you in the right ways. And life should challenge you. Your children should challenge you. Your job, if you, ch if, if you get to the top of your job, of your field, it may no longer have any new challenges for you. So now you've got to seek a new challenge or maybe a related challenge. 
And that's why I look for a new topic, a new challenge. And, and the more impossible to answer the question is, the more interested I am in pursuing it. I mean, how do you answer existentialism? <laughs> why do we exist? There's no answer. It's impossible to answer. But I set out to find an answer. And, and then after I finished, I found my answer, then I needed something even more inexplicable than existence itself. What could that possibly be? Marriage. Well, of course. <laughs> so I set out to solve the mystery of marriage. And, and onward it goes. I get it preaching to the choir for sure but i think for many people like this woman that i'm mentioning you know the the way that she was raised was you you go on this path you get very highly educated then you do postgraduate work then you become the top of your field and that becomes your identity and when that becomes your identity of course she had big questions like, who would I be if I didn't live from this pathway anymore? How would I ever explain that to the folks, for instance, that now I want to go and hike in Nepal and I'm not going to be at the top of my field anymore. So I, I love what you say because the happiness is in the process, but I think the challenge, when you know everything and everybody turns to you to be at, at that point where you are the authority on something or everyone thinks you are you have good press and everyone thinks you are um you have to still live day by day and that whole thing about resting on laurels they have thorns i mean they may not actually have thorns but they do because no no that's, now i gotta do something else now i'm not, <laughs> now i'm i'm motivated I, I i need something else what am i going to to do to feed my brain so I understand completely, and I think it is so amazingly wonderful that when I was preparing for our talk, the first thing that I wrote down is, what's the lure of tackling the unknowable? And then there you went, the impossible and the unknowable. Can I tell you, you know, if, the, if your friend came to me and, and asked me for advice, I, I'll tell you what I would tell her. And this is what I learned in making the nature of existence. It's when I asked people, why do we exist? What I realized was that the real question should be, what, what is my purpose? Because why do I exist implies there is a reason. There's no purpose, there's no reason. The purpose is what you give it. So now, how do you find your purpose? When I interviewed uh, some of these, uh, you know, dozens of experts, one of the answers I got is that Happiness is not a goal that you can pursue. It's a side effect of having a purpose in life. You get happiness when you're pursuing your purpose. So once you determine your purpose and you begin to follow it, happiness comes as a natural byproduct from that. So how do you determine your purpose? That's the next question. And you have to decide, right? And my answer, once I thought about this after talking to all the gurus, the experts, priests, ministers, scientists. I look at it this way, that the universe, this universe that we're a part of is made up of stars that are being born and that are dying infinitely over millions and billions of years. We are a part of this overall grand scheme of creation and destruction. Now you can align yourself with one of these energies, creation or destruction. If you align yourself with destruction, you're going to be unhappy, in, in, that's in my belief. If you align yourself with creation, you'll be much happier. So wh what, do you, what do you create? Well, you, if you create daily, if you create something, happiness will come naturally. It doesn't matter what it is as long as it's important to you. You can write a poem, make a new dance, plant a garden, bring forth life. Uh, paint something, take sculpting classes, anything that intrigues you, that, that, that draws you toward it. For most people, the default is to have, a, make, to, to have a child or create a younger version of themselves, hopefully a better version, and then spend the next 18 years raising this new entity. And then until once it finally leaves the nest or you kick it out of the basement, you know, within <laughs> a couple of decades, and then you're back to where you started, and now you've got your own purpose to consider again. And that's why you find people taking up hobbies at that point, or changing careers, or looking for that new challenge, creating, you know, a, a business proposal, buying and, and decorating houses, 
and flipping houses. It doesn't matter as long as it's, it challenges your creativity, you create daily and you offer your, your, the results of your creation to your social group for their reaction, good, bad, otherwise, and then go on and create something else until you're no longer able, maybe you're not ambulatory anymore and your time is done. But as Einstein once said that once you stop learning, you start dying. So you've got to keep learning and challenging yourself your whole life. Ideally, people around you will help you do that if you select them well. I am applauding, of course, because <laughs> I agree with you. Um, but the whole idea of creation, some, some people don't have the, the in fortitude to consider themselves worthy of creating something. I, I come from a small town and I come from the, well, it was small when I came from it, uh, the, and the most redneck blue collar corner of that small town. And as a very creative person, I sang and, and played the piano and, you know, all that kind of thing. And um, so it was like, hmm, aren't you just going to get a job at the mill kind of thing? Like, are you, you're just going to be a secretary. Why are you doing all this? <laughs> or or this, um, this feature that why should we get bigger than our boots in some sense? And some people are raised in that kind of limitation. How do you suggest that they open their minds and open their hearts to the possibility of the ability to create anything that moves them? Start small. Anyone can plant a seed, get a packet of seeds. If you've got a little spot of land somewhere and dig, a, dig some dirt up and plant some tomato seeds and then watch it grow. And it brings such joy to see the growth and the progression of the creation that you are involved with and you're gonna help nurture it and, and help bring it forth. Or what I do is, or would recommend it if you wanna do what I do, have your creative time every day, five minutes, 30 minutes, two hours in the morning, or 30 minutes at night, whatever it is. And during that time, you do something that, that you enjoy. Is it drawing, writing, painting, sketching, thinking of new business ideas, anything that's creative at all? Start small. Maybe it's just five minutes sketching. If, you know, I think there was a study where they took some people who were depressed and gave them a sketch pad and said, just get, just draw something. They, don't, they weren't artists. And while they're sketching something, the depression is no longer an issue. It's not part of who they are because they're now in the, a creative endeavor. If when people lose the, the, uh, the desire or they're not in an environment that encourages creativity, it naturally goes away. And so you have to awaken it. Just start small. I like that. And because everybody can do something that maybe stretches them just for five minutes, maybe have a new thought. I remember in this small town that I grew up in, I'm the library. The library was so important. Let me get to the library. <laughs> And especially the one-on-ones, you know, let me get there to the Dewey Decimal System. But many people don't have that encouragement when they're young to be creative. Maybe um, this will stimulate people to do that. So in talking about being creative, tell us what the concept was that popped into your head that said, I am going to find out what the truth about marriage is. Well, my own failures, I think, were part of the stimulus like what's wrong with me? Why can't I get to the altar? Why can't I hold a relationship together for more than four years? Is it me? Am I unusual? It's once again, it was sort of self analysis, just trying to solve my own problem. I contacted the 15 or so some of the top psychologists or therapists um, on the planet and asked if I could come and ask them some questions. Imagine going to 15 different top rated therapists with the questions bothering you most, spending two hours asking them all to explain these things. And then because I brought a camera, it's free. <laughs> I get to walk out, no charge. And all my problems have been addressed, discussed, thought about. I feel a little better about myself. I've learned, oh, that's why. Because in school, 
in high school, they teach you, they teach us math, science, uh, gym class, English, but nobody teaches us how to have a relationship. That's true. And that's sad. You know, I say all the time, Roger, that if I could just have every single person come to me when they're 21, <laughs> so that I could look at all of the emotional baggage they have with them and have them recognize that this may be baggage or it may be carry on. Which would you like to accept now that you're 21 that was given to you or dumped in your bag? <laughs> and what would you like to relieve yourself of, maybe replace and go on with? And this whole idea of relationship is such an important one because many people don't realize that in the first five years when our brain is quite less developed than it ever is in our life that even before we have language we are learning about relationship we are watching we're sensing we're feeling whether we're wanted we're feeling whether we can bring joy to other people when we smile we find out if we had our needs met we're learning about relationship and that continues so i'm really interested to know what did you find with the commonalities and how diverse were the answers in those groups there are some very specific things i was seeking that's what i was looking for what are some specific things that anybody can do to correct the trajectory of their personal relationships or to improve them let's say they have a relationship already and, and make it better because if our metric for success and failure is whether people stay together, there's a 50% failure rate for this product we call marriage. And the other 50% that we call a success are still very difficult and hard work to keep going. If someone was selling you a product, you'd say, go back to the drawing board and get your success rate up. And what I learned from all of these experts is that there are specific things. We're all doing relationships wrong, at least some less wrong than others. And through trial and error, people, many people have found ways to, inter, to, to coexist and even thrive. But what are those things that they've learned? And if we could teach people that when they're young, imagine how much better their lives would be. And so you asked, what are those things? One of those things is that we are terrible listeners, especially men. This is really, the masculine is more guilty of this than the feminine. Gender, it's not even about gender because we all have masculine and feminine within us to a certain proportion, but the masculine is an egregious offender of the listening problem. You need to make eye contact with your partner and ask, how was your day? How are you feeling? You have to ask the masculine needs to ask the feminine and give her 15 to 20 minutes per day of this relationship vitamin of, uh, of empathy. Yes, and then and then you've got to shut up and men yes are horrible at this they, yes, they don't know please. how to shut up <laughs> please shut up and <laughs> <laughs> and when you're listening don't be doing anything else you know as you say look into their eyes put um, your cell phone on airplane mode then say how was your day how are you feeling and shut up for 15 to 20 minutes maybe you can throw in a oh that's wonderful i'm so sorry that's great but everything else just let the emotions come out put in that listening time everybody's happier the relationship just gets better everything about the relationship gets better that's the number one thing i would like to try to teach men or the masculine I'd be happy if you did that because that would make my job simpler because often we have to start there. I have clients all over the world, of course, because I work with couples. And yes, it's true. And I would add another question to that, which is, how do you feel about your day? I mean, you said, how do you feel, which is a great thing. But when you ask the how was your day question, like that's so unspecific. And we want to leave a generality. But if we go to the feeling question first, when we're talking with our spouses and our spouse happens to be female, it is really a good idea to say, how do you feel about your day? Because that residual feeling summing up, like it's way more information than it was a good day or a bad day or a trying day or a struggling day. When we look at how do I feel about who I was today? and who people perceived me as being becomes a very, very important ingredient. So I love this. I can hardly wait to watch this film. So for those of you who are just joining us, my guest today is Roger Nygaard, and he has done some amazing documentaries, yes. And uh, some of those, of course, are uh, ones that you may have known 
um, because you may be a Trekkie, you may be interested in Roswell and and uh, watch Six Days in Roswell. Maybe you're like me and you're much more fascinated by more esoteric things, so you maybe watch The Nature of Existence. And now he has delved into the truth about marriage, so you're going to watch for that. It's coming out on Valentine's Day. And if you want to know more about Roger, you're going to go to the truth the truth about marriage.com and learn more about Roger and this upcoming film and the book because he wisely took 15 top psychotherapists and then said oh not only talk but also let's put it in print so that's really good the truth about marriage.com Roger Nygaard so when we are looking at the truth about marriage, isn't it true that there are many truths about marriage? Yes, absolutely. And the book has many different specific tips along with the listening <laughs> tip that if you just incorporate these things, you'll, you'll, you'll be so much happier because our happiness is intertwined with the people that we know. We're social creatures. We have to, we, we interact socially. You're nodding your head, right? <laughs> We're very social creatures, most of us. But some of us are social in a small group, and some of us are much more comfortable to be able to be in a large group. Some people will have those three to five friends that some people talk about. Other people will say, oh, yeah, I've got 300 friends, and then there's the people on Facebook. So that also predicates how you're going to be in relationship. Because if you have a lot of people to have your needs met from, or you have only few, then you put more eggs in a basket. That That's one of the problems. You put your finger on it. What, what uh, Tai Toshiro, who wrote uh, the book, The, the uh, Science of um, Happily Ever After, mm -hmm. he said that the reason, or one of the main reasons that people have trouble in relationships is because the way our culture is now, and our culture has changed radically from when we were living on the African savanna 200,000 years ago. Really? We expect, right, we expect our partner to, to fulfill all of our needs, right. which is unrealistic for anyone. We used to have a small group or a band that we lived within, and everybody got it. We got our needs fed a little bit from each person from here and there. Maybe this one is a great conversationalist. This one is more tactile. This one is an empath or whatever. This one's a good storyteller. We got our needs met through many different people instead of putting it all, as you said, all in one basket. And it's very difficult for any one person to feel like they are satisfying you when you have so many needs that are expected to be met. It's, imp it's an impossible expectation. Yeah, absolutely. I remember one fellow that I was dating, I said to him, um, what, do you, what do you think I should do about this? And he said, that's a girlfriend question. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> like, go ask a girlfriend. Don't ask me that. Um, because when you, when you, and it wasn't my case, but I wanted to know what he had to think about it. But it, it, if we're too demanding and too dependent on that one person to meet all of our needs, it is so unrealistic. Now, occasionally I've had people who have just found the perfect person. They both have um, that need for that one person and it suits them very well. They live a very iconoclastic life and they're happy with that. But mostly we need to have a social circle that we can turn to for ideas or input. Now, I want to put a disclaimer in this because of my doctorate in psychology. Don't go getting the collective advice of all your friends about your relationship <laughs> because that's not really a good way to go. Go and get some help. Tell your story there. Don't go around collecting everybody's ideas because really what you're doing is endeavoring to get people onto your side and have them in your back pocket. And that is not fair to the relationship. So use therapy wisely. That's my, my recommendation. But, you know, you're so right. We went from a tribe mentality where different things were handled by different people. And then we get down to this oneness. And then we have this myth 
that this person is supposed to be the be all end all turn to provider of all of my intimate my intellectual my conversational my psychological emotional needs <laughs> and when they don't do it it's like mm, not good enough um but there's an erroneous assumption isn't it yeah, we break up then. We think, well, it's, I'm not in love anymore. Or it's not the right match. You're not my soulmate because you didn't fulfill all my needs. I need to find the person who can do that. And that'll be an endless goal. That'll never, you'll never succeed at finding someone who can fill all your needs. There's, so you, the answer is in the, to happiness in a relationship starts with acceptance of yourself, who you are, what kind of a species you are, what's natural and normal. <laughs> for you to want and feel and then accepting your partner and for who they are what they need and and what's realistic for them to want and think about they uh when i interviewed the gottmans dr julia schwartz gottman told me the statistic that 69 percent of all relationship problems are never solved they're just acknowledged discussed and then you move on acceptance and the way to do that is they teach what they teach at the Gottman Institute is how to dialogue with your partner so you can do that and then move forward. Yes. And, and, you know, they say it, I say it, lots of people say it. You're going to have things that you don't agree on. You don't have to wear it down and tear it apart until you come to some agreement. It's Sometimes, a good thing. Not, yeah, it's a very good thing. You know, what I tell people all the time, Roger, is a great marriage or a great relationship, if you don't bother to get married, is that you have two successful individuals who know themselves, know what they're up to in the world, who, who don't live like this, and they don't live like this. They are two, and they choose to come together. So they're fine apart, but they choose an enlarged world by sharing it together. And when we look at it that way, that other person's not there to meet my needs. That person, you know, there's no expectations of that person being everything except perhaps a loyal and have the five relational gifts that I talk about that you're going to find honesty, safety, trust, respect, and reliability in there. And the three hallmarks of a healthy relationship that I talk about, which I'd love to hear uh, if, you, if these came up in your film, equality, reciprocity, and mutuality. And if those things are not present, even on in your workplace relationships, you're going to have trouble with it. So we could talk forever, but I want to know what is the major affirmation that you got from making the film and then extrapolating it into a book? If I had to boil it down and I had someone boil it down, one of the people I interviewed boiled it down, I said, what, what's your best relationship advice? And it kind of sums up what you just so well elucidated in these three and five different uh, aspects is ask for what you want, number one, because nobody can read your mind. They don't know. They have no idea what you want. And be courageous to tell them what you want, what you need for you. And then be fair about it. Be fair, be a kind, be fair, fair. Love, love, love is fairness and kindness. And, and if, if you can embody those two things, be fair and ask for what you want, it kind of it sums up everything. Mm -hmm. I would certainly add something to that because I applaud that. I love that. Um, I would add this, that emotional intimacy Emotional maturity requires that when you ask for what you want, that you are as equally willing to hear yes or no. Because if you put all the expectations on the yes, like you're my person and you have to do this, you are missing the inquiry of who are we. And a relationship is a me and a me that create a we. That means there are three entities in the relationship that all have to be considered and balanced. And so if we put all of our energy into, if I ask you for something, if you love me, you will do it. <laughs> yeah. We have a problem, right? Yeah, well, I think part of it is switching out the word you. Don't use the word you, only use the word I. And uh, John Gottman put it this way also. He said that you have to, if you, if you say, here's the recipe for what works for me. This is what makes me feel good. Yes. I feel good when this happens. I feel best when the house is clean. I feel better when we're on time to meetings or 
I like this, I don't like that. Mm -hmm. As opposed to, uh, you're a slob, you're never on time. This puts someone on a defensive crouch. Yeah, exactly. Makes them and unhappy. It does. And, you know, in, uh, I wrote a book called Kaizen for Couples. And in there, I put my formula, which I've been teaching for 27 years, which is simpler, sim um, similar to what John said. And it's called the Personal Weather Report. And the, to learn to give a personal weather report means you're only going to speak about yourself. But in giving a personal weather report, then you are allowing somebody into your world without expectation. It's like saying, let me tell you what's going on within me so that you can respond or not respond and I can observe your response or your non-response. And then we can see where to go from there. So there's so many things that we have to learn and I don't mean that we must learn. I mean that they're available to learn, to improve a relationship, to get that feeling that you want, which is that connectedness, that specific individual, you know, like they say on Grey's Anatomy, you need your person. <laughs> that that person is there for you and with you and that you can talk with them about anything and it won't be rejected. They may say, I'm uncomfortable or could we talk about that tomorrow because I'm not in a good space right now, but that you know that you're safe to talk about anything. And that is sort of the ultimate, you know, to be able to talk about anything, ask anything, and to be able to accept yes or no as an answer and not have it be the end of the world. You know, I'm writing a new book right now on a topic that really needs well, of course, in my thinking, it really needs <laughs> writing about. And uh, I've given it a name. I'm not going to share it just now. But I think that when we get into certain kinds of thinking, it shuts us down. And we don't even realize it. And often it comes from having trauma and abuse in our background. And so it, it gives us a certain um, closed off ability that keeps us from exactly what it is that we are hoping a relationship will give us. So any parting words, Roger? Well, I told you that listening is my number one goal. I've tried to try to teach people how to listen, to the masculine, listen, and then shut up. Don't try to fix anything. Yes. There's a counterpoint to that, to the feminine, I should add, to be fair, yes. that what the feminine has to accept and understand about the masculine is that if you, the mistake we make is that we assume our partner wants the same thing we want. And so we give our partner the things that we feel we need. And it may not be like the, the language of love, right? That we, we all have different styles of that we want, how we want to be loved. But if you, if the feminine can understand this, that the masculine wants to, wants connection, the feminine wants connection 24 seven. The masculine also wants connection, but once the masculine has connection, he seeks freedom. He yearns for freedom. And so then now he wants to get away. And it's natural, as natural as the moon orbiting the earth. He, and so he's going to orbit away. And then once he's away and has freedom, he misses you. He misses the feminine. And he wants to return. And then he comes back and, and reconnects. And if you try to stop this orbit, this natural cycle, it's going to create frustration in your masculine partner. And that frustration leads to eventually to anger and, and, and other problems. So if you can allow the orbit to happen, you'll be, well, you'll both be much happier. Now, the way for the masculine to facilitate this, the best way is to announce when you're disconnecting, honey, I'm going to go bowling with my buddies. And at the same time, you announce when you're going to reconnect. I'm going bowling with my buddies and I'm looking so I'm so looking forward to seeing you for dinner tonight when I return at 7:30. Now, she's she feels safe, she feels secure, she knows where you're going to be and that you're disconnecting and when the reconnection will happen and when you reconnect everything your your energies are rekindled because your polarities have been reestablished and the natural cycle is flowing, but the man, the masculine has to respect that this is, an, is a, a limited resource and you have to keep your word. If you say 7.30, you must be home at 7.30. It's better to take your lumps up front. If it's going to be midnight, say midnight. Or if you're going to be late, you must call. Now, you don't have to do any of these things, 
it's only if you want to be happier, th then maybe think about trying it as an experiment. And for the, the feminine, for the listening aspect, you, 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 get, you should get your 15 to 20 or 35 minutes, whatever it is per night, but don't abuse it. Don't make it go on for two hours or, or there's going to be a reaction, there's going to be a pullback, and then it'll be, it'll be reduced. So both sides need to accept these differences about each other, and we are meant to be, we're meant to complete each other, not to be, uh, to, to duplicate each other. That's why we're different. That's why there's a masculine and a feminine and there are differences. And sometimes the, the woman or, or even in a gay couple, the feminine side or the masculine side, we all have both, but each partner tends to have a preponderance of the other so that there is a matchup of opposites. Well said. Obviously, we could talk for a very, very long time. Maybe we'll do it again in six months, and that would be great. After you've had some response to the movie and the book, it would be a great time to talk. Thanks so much, Roger. I would love to do that. Yeah, thank you. Great. My guest today has been Roger Nygaard. Whether you're interested in Trekkies, the nature of existence, the possibilities in life, or the truth about marriage, you're going to want to follow Roger. So go to thetruthaboutmarriage.com and do that. I'm Dr. Roberta Shaler. You find me at transformingrelationship.com. And I invite you to listen to other in the series of podcasts. Listen to my other podcast. It's for people in toxic relationships. It's called Save Your Sanity. Go to saveyoursanitypodcast.com or find me on YouTube at 4, F-O-R, Relationship Help, H-E-L-P. So much to talk about. It's so exciting, and I was so glad you were my guest. Stay tuned, everybody. Come back, listen to something else, and re-listen to what Roger had to say, because that's really good stuff. Talk soon. Thank you for joining me on the Save Your Sanity podcast today. I hope you've had some new insights, some ideas and strategies to help you gain clarity and confidence for moving forward toward greater emotional health and safety. You deserve that, and so do your children. If you found value here and would like to support this podcast with a dollar or five each month, please do so at patreon.com slash save your sanity. Learn more about how to work with me by a video conference, join my optimized circles, or subscribe to this podcast on my YouTube channel at my website.